I'm here to share a little bit of my story, um, uh, sort of, I guess, my journey with I Quit Sugar. Um, only six or seven weeks ago, I had the launch of my book in a, in a Potts Point bookstore, and I invited friends and family and uh, organised for some kale chips and some activated nuts. And anyone who uh, is from the eastern suburbs will find the comedy in that. Um, and I got up there, and uh, in the, my sort of flustery kind of nervousness, I... I announced to the group that, you know, that it was all an accident. This whole kind of I Quit Sugar thing was all of an accident. And um, I think the language I used in front of my family and friends was, it was a clusterfuck of shitfulness. And um, <laughs> I looked across and my mother kind of gave my father that look that she has reserved just for things like this, things that I've done over the last 39 years. And I think I heard Matt Preston, um, you know, sort of choke on a kale chip behind me. Um, but the truth of the matter was that um, the whole I Quit Sugar journey was very much a struggle and it was very much about resistance on my part. It was not a strategic um, journey at all. And when Tim asked me to share the story tonight, I thought, oh, thank goodness, I can actually explain what a clusterfuck of shitfulness was all about. Um, and I can share how the struggle and the resistance that I've put up to um, all of this has actually led to some of the greatest insights um, in my 39 years on this planet and brought me the closest to happiness that I've experienced. Um, so I'm really glad that, you know, I'm able to do this and share it with you tonight because I think um, along my journey I've realised that mostly people want to know that they're not alone in their, in their own shit and um, they want to know that their shit has some purpose and uh, I'm here to tell you that it can. Um, and I promise to everyone out there I'm going to stop swearing. Uh, from this point forward. I'll refer to, hang on, I'll, I'll refer to my shitfulness from this point forward as the stuff that happened. So, that's, um, okay, so first, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so my first instance of stuff happening to me was, as Tim alluded to earlier, I got quite sick four or five years ago. I was the editor of Cosmopolitan at the time, and I was very much a square peg being forced into a round hole. And this really upset me until I realised that I was the person forcing myself into this round hole. I was banging myself into this hole day over, you know, after day after day. And uh, that was even more disconcerting. Um, it got really abrasive. And I suppose it, you know, eventually it got me very, very sick. Um, I had adrenal collapse. And I think we saw what happens when we get stressed in that um, WA uh, commercial. Um, I had adrenal collapse and then I developed a sort of a, a host of autoimmune diseases. Um, and I guess my body collapsed because I wasn't going to stop. It stopped, you know, and lay down and basically said, we're not going anywhere until you address all of this. Um, of course, I kept forcing myself. I really took a while to learn this. Oh, hang on. Now, can you ignore the image on the right just for a moment? Because um, I'll get to that. But, um, you know... My body collapsed in a heap, and that was around about the time that I met Tim. Um, I wasn't willing to learn my lesson, so I decided to become the host of, of MasterChef. Um, and I love that picture, actually, because it really sums up my time there. I kind of was on the outskirts. I kind of, I don't know, there were three portly men and this girl that kind of floated in and out every now and then. I'm sure most of you remember MasterChef, but you probably uh, don't quite remember that there was a female host in the first series. But there I was. I remember being there, definitely. Um, <laughs> Anyway, after the first series, I decided I was once again a square peg in a round hole and I could not do this any, anymore. And it was a memorable moment, wasn't it, Tim, when I imploded. A lot of people think I make very rational decisions and, wow, you make these great decisions to leave things. Well, no, they're usually implosions. And on this occasion, it was definitely an implosion. And I won't share, share the details, but... Um, I then decided to pack everything in and go overseas and I had an opportunity... Um, my first book deal was to write the biography of a porn star. And if I thought that I'd been cheating myself at Cosmo, um, well, I just didn't get the message. Anyway, I spent three months living with a porn star between LA and New York. And uh, I was an extra in a wonderful film called A Latin Affair. That's it there. Um, and 
three months into to this ordeal, um, the porn star decided she wasn't going to quit politics and enter, uh, sorry, quit porn and enter politics. Seriously, that was the brief. She was going to enter politics. Um, she decided to stick with porn. At which point, I decided I'd implode again. Um, so I was forcing myself, forcing myself. While I was in America, I decided to approach Oprah magazine with this great idea. I thought, well, I'll go around the world investigating wellness ideas and get paid for it. And they, they took me up on it. They um, decided to give me a contract. And while I was there, the Lehman Brothers thing happened and um, media went into a sort of free fall and my contract got cancelled. So that was one of the first of the 20, whatever it was, you remember better than me. There was a lot of jobs that got, I, I got turned down from. So I came home and, you know, during this time, as Tim mentioned, there was a car stolen. I had phones disconnected over and over. I had three accidents involving my leg. I split my knee open twice. I was in a, on crutches twice in that period and uh, I still wasn't getting the message, you know. There was, a, there was something going on here. So instead I decided to climb Machu Picchu. <laughs> um, and I actually don't remember much of that trip. It's documented because I, I wrote a story for Gourmet Traveller about it. Um, and I climbed the mountain and then I had real difficulties getting back down because my health had suffered so terribly. Um, so yes, a number, of, a number of lessons. And around about this time, I was you know, sort of visiting Tim on and off and um, learning how to meditate. And he sat me down once and tried to point out some of the, the lessons, the things that were going on. And he said to me, Sarah, you need to get your grubby mitts off life. Just let go, get your grubby mitts off it. And he's, he's said it too many, many times, uh, many, many times, um, I think, over the sort of four or five years we've known each other. But what came out of all of this is that it forced me to go online. I was out of work for sort of nine months, and in some, oh, for some months I was unable to leave the house, unable to work, unable to walk, and, you know, um, things just fell apart. But it forced me to work online, and I guess that was the first gift of a few to come out of my stuff that happened. Um, after this, uh, for some reason, I got approached by Sunday Life to write a, a column, and so my Oprah column became my Sunday Life column, and uh, one week I was stuck uh, for a topic to, to write about, and I decided to quit sugar. I um, thought, well, you know, I've been told by a number of doctors and specialists that I needed to quit sugar for my autoimmune disease. I'd been resisting it, and I thought, here was a good uh, excuse to give it a go, and there's nothing like a deadline to make you do something. So... Again, out of, I guess, a whole range of calamities, um, two things. I was forced to work online and I was almost forced into quitting sugar. And, you know, even though these were two things I wasn't really expecting to do, they happened at an amazing time. And it started to occur to me that something was uh, starting to flow, something was coming together here. But I decided to get my grubby mitts all over it again and another implosion later, I find myself um, putting on my fisherman pants and getting out of the city and racking off to Byron Bay, because that's what you do when you're a bit lost and confused and you've got your grubby mitts on things. So I went and lived in an army hut in the, on seven acres of forest, um, you know, to really get away from it all. And um, that was where I worked um, each day. It looks very idyllic, and trust me, it, it, I managed to make it not very idyllic. Um, so for nine months, I toiled away at a book about myself. I'd been commissioned, this is book number two, by the way, and, and one of the publishers is in the room this evening, so she's probably laughing at this. But um, nine months, I toiled away at this book. I got 60,000 words in three months before the deadline. I imploded once again and threw the whole book away. Um, basically, I was abrasing. I was feeling that abrasion again, and it was... I, I thought of the analogy today, I thought of a bunch, but the, probably the tamest of them was um, forcing dairy whip back into the nozzle. That's what it was like. <laughs> it just wasn't right. Um, so, another implosion. Um, and I was starting to see a pattern here um, that every time I decided to have my grubby mitts all over something, it imploded. Um, anyway, in the meantime, while I was meant to be writing this incredibly insightful book, you know, the I Quit Sugar thing was coming along, you know, it developed into a few posts, I got obsessed, I interviewed pretty much ex every expert around the world that I could find, I read all the science, I did more and more posts, people were saying, you know, we're, 
what about this and what about that? And so hang on, you know, I'll go and investigate it and the following week I'd write another post and I started cooking. Um, so rather than writing uh, my memoirs, I, I cooked up food and, um, you know, took photos of it. I think halfway through the experience, Instagram was invented, so there's a few Instagram shots there. Um, so so I, f I had a few people say to me, well, listen, how did you quit sugar? How do you do it? I then decided I'd put together what I'd done um, based on all my sort of personal experience into an e-book. And I thought, I'll sell a couple hundred to the people who've been asking for it. And I, I charged it at a cost that I thought would, you know, cover my costs. And uh, anyway, it sold and it sold and it sold. And then people were asking me, well, what do you cook? And I realised after a while I had... 108 recipes that I'd sort of put together, and I put that into a cookbook, my second ebook. And this, mind you, was only, gosh, Joe, how long ago was that one? Middle of last year. It was July last year, so it was all quite recent. Um, anyway, they kept selling, and I sort of realised, and in fact, that figure about 70,000 people was before I launched the hard copy book. So I think that's probably doubled now, or at least uh, people are, are sort of probably halfway through my program. Um, so, I guess, oh, okay, end of last year, um, Pam McMillan approached me and said, well, we might put your two e-books together into a hard copy book. And I was kind of like really feeling a bit of resistance here. And um, I was feeling resistance the whole way along, I've got to say. Um, I was feeling very self-conscious. I thought, well, I'm not an expert in all of this. I was also feeling self-conscious about the fact that, really, I have no idea what I'm I'm on, on about most of the time, you know. Um, <laughs> I feel most days like a fraud and I feel very self-conscious. Also about walking down the street, I have days where I, you know, my health isn't, isn't very good. I don't look like a, a, a good uh, beacon of, of sugar-free living. Um, and that will be the day that I run into the person in the supermarket who wants to cling to me and tell me all about their illness or their, their problems and, and invariably I cry with them, you know, and, and I kind of, you know, I, I struggled, I guess, um, with this whole process and when it, you know, I was approached about it becoming a hard copy book, it, it, I guess it tipped me even that little bit further. So, what do you reckon I did? <laughs> I took off again. Um, my CV, I was starting to really worry about my CV at this stage. Um, so as my book was being put together um, by a team of people, I sort of handed it over to my publisher, Ingrid, and uh, my beautiful assistant, Joe, to sort of take care of it. I, I took off once again. I um, packed my two suitcases into one suitcase, which I then packed into that one Byron Bay bag, which you can see in the top left-hand corner, took off to Iceland and, and hiked some... Um, some, some ice and anyway the bloody book followed me um, it chased me across the world because we needed a new cover and we needed some new inset shots and oh could you actually come up with another 20 recipes so my 20 recipes were developed in in Greece and that was where I developed my 20 recipes on a very remote island where people live the longest in the world so it's a beautiful island to be in um, and um, the beautiful photographer who photographed my books, Maria, who I met really only just over a year ago. Um, and she just said, if you're doing a book, I'm photographing it and you're not paying me for it. I just want to do it because I believe in you. Um, eventually I did pay her, but she was really willing to do it for free. She decided to fly to me. And so in, there we are in Copenhagen. Um, I bought a new dress and a new pair of shoes. I needed to have um, a new outfit. And we hired a rickshaw and we... Um, rode round Copenhagen, <laughs> finding food and locations, and um, pretty much most of the book is shot in one day, riding around on a rickshaw, and the various people you see in the book who look like my friends are random, handsome, <laughs> Scandinavian men who I accosted in markets and said, could you pretend to be my friend while we sit here casually eating some activated nuts? Um, and in fact... The shot, which is the cover shot on the bottom right-hand corner, um, that was done, you know, using a whole lot of borrowed food, and it was in an alleyway in the middle of Copenhagen, and we just thought, oh, look, you know, that'll work. <laughs> We're really glad it did. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, not particularly well planned. Um, but I guess somewhere between, I guess, Greece and, and Provence, which, by the way... Um, 
I then split my knee open for a third time uh, in Provence as I was heading off for a mountain bike ride. Um, I took that as just an accident. It wasn't anything, any message I had to learn on this particular occasion. But I decided to break all of this down and um, I wanted to have a look at, I'm not going to have to use this word again, I had to look at what the shitfulness meant. And I realised that it was actually moments where I was hanging on really tightly. So I had this white knuckled, uh, you know, sort of grip. You know, I had my grubby mitts on it and it was very much a white knuckled grip on things. And I was holding on too hard, the pressure build up, built up and an explosion would happen. And when that happened, after I'd had time to sort of, you know, recover from the explosion, um, what would happen is the flow of life would then come gushing in. Um, and what I realised is that it's kind of like being on a river and what I was trying to do was pile up a whole heap of logs and steer the river in the direction I thought. So I was building up these embankments in the middle of, you know, of rivers, piling them all up and hanging onto them for dear life. And eventually the pressure behind would build up will, and build up and then all of a sudden there'd be this almighty explosion and um, logs would be thrown to pieces, you know, I'd be thrown onto the bank and then life, you know, flowed on as it needed to. Um, it took its natural course. Um, this is not random and it's not, you know, karma and it's not anything particularly woo-woo. This is straight up physics, you know. I was blocking the flow of my own life. Um, and so what I've interpreted as sort of some gifts or some opportunities that have come out of my struggle are actually just, you know, moments where I've allowed life to flow in. And, you know, I said this at the launch of my book, that sometimes life just finds you. And in the case of, you know, this whole I Quit Sugar journey, it's been very much the case. Um, I kind of make some analogies with my meditation practice as well. And Tim's heard me say this on many occasions, and many of you are, uh, you know, I've probably meditated with some of you in the room on, from time to time, and I say this often. I've been meditating for, you know, more than four years, and I am the worst meditator I guarantee in this room. Um, you know, it's kind of like, have you ever microwaved popcorn in a paper bag and it's just this exploding, jerking bag of stuff? That's what my experience is. And I actually jerk and twitch the whole way through my meditation. It's really not pretty at all. But I stick with it. And what I've realised is um, this struggle, this popcorn in a bag kind of struggle that I have is actually what matters to me. Um, every day, morning and night, I sit down and go through the process of witnessing it and going, hey, Sarah, that's what you do. You struggle, you know, and that's just what I do. And I've found a kind of nice place for that because there's no point practising, you know, meditation for me is practising for real life, you know what I mean? It's 20 minutes of practising and getting to the kind of space that you want to then carry on into the rest of your life. That's how I see it. I don't really take it too much further into transcending. You know, I'm several lifetimes off that, trust me. Um, but, you know, and this is a conversation I had with the Dalai Lama once, uh, in all seriousness, um, that, you know, what's, he actually said, well, what's the point of practising in a, in, a, in a sort of an environment of sereneness? Because life isn't serene. You might as well try to find your sereneness amongst the shit, you know what I mean? Like, you might as well find sereneness amongst the, the struggle. Um, it's like a grid of sand, you know, it's the grid of sand, the, the irritation that in, occurs when this grid of sand rolls around, that's what becomes the pearl. Um, I've got lots of metaphors. I think of high jumpers, you know, like high jumpers, before they can glide and fly through the air, they need friction, they need a rough surface to kind of ricochet off. And anyway, this all goes through my head like popcorn in a paper bag in a microwave. Uh, I guess just very, very recently, and it is very, very recently, and very much in tandem with this I Quit Sugar journey, that um, I've realised that, you know, I've sort of taken up a lilo. You know, rather than building my log embankments, I now kind of try to sit on the lilo and flow <laughs> along this river. Every now and then I grab a log and try to kind of get some security in it all, and it, it explodes pretty much instantly, um, without the huge drama as it used to in the past. And I've realised that what I'm doing now is kind of my dharma. And, and Tim, you know, you read out that blog post, it was very much going on for me this week, that this is just what I do. And I'm trying to come to terms with that, I suppose. Um, I'm trying to sail gently through my shit. 
I've said I broke my promise, I know, but I'm just trying to, um, to do that these days. I guess the final point that I, I want to make is that my I Quit Sugar journey has attracted a fair bit of resistance. Um, let's just say I'm on Coca-Cola's radar right now, and um, I have some interesting representatives that pop up on my social media radar. Um, Generally, they're very attractive 20-something young women. And when I go to look at their Twitter avatar, they just don't exist. Uh, they've got one tweet, and it's generally geared at me. Um, and this is a common experience for a lot of us who are in this, um, this sort of area, because it's very new, and it's very much what, I guess, Big Sugar is wanting to, to tear down. Um, but it's really funny. I get lobbed, you know, a ball of insult, whether it's on my blog or, uh, you know, sort of on Twitter or, or Instagram. And, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I can see the ball coming towards me. You know, it's like, here we go again. Oh, yeah, it's that one again. He's, you know. And it's coming towards me. But the problem is, for these poor people trying to insult me, is that they've got nothing sturdy for their ball of insult to hit up against. Because you know, all it can do is kind of flop flaccidly into my pond of struggle. It's like, hey, come and join me, you know. <laughs> I don't really know where all of this is going to head. I'm exploring it. I'm trying to get to the bottom of it. I don't claim to be an absolute expert in all of this. You know, I quit sugar. The name of my book isn't You Must All Quit Sugar or I'm on a rampage to get everybody on the planet to quit sugar. It's an invitation. Um, and... I think that that's kind of where I've very much arrived at, you know. What I do, I hope, and what I've done and where I've ended up um, is just an invitation. And, um, you know, that's where I hope to, I guess, leave it. And, you know, there I, go. There I am with I quit sugar, not you must quit sugar. Um, <laughs> but, yes, that's, that's as much as I feel... Uh, comfortable sharing with you right now. Um, I think I've got, uh, and if you want to know more about absolutely everything in my life, you can read about it on my vlog. But um, I think I've got time, Tim, for a couple of questions. Is that right? Or not really? Not so much. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, that's all right. No, no. Um, I'm, I have got some books to sell out at the back and I am more than happy to sign them. And if you want, if I can be one of your three people, if you like. So you can come and ask me a question then. Um, thank you very much for your time. Yeah.